Hey, hey, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with the CEO at Lang AI, Jorge Penalva. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for having me. Makes me happy to have you for many reasons, including you're a fellow Spaniard living in Silicon Valley uh, and who's been working on AI way before Gen AI was cool. So maybe we can start from there. Why don't you tell us more about what is Lang AI? Yeah, basically, uh, Lang AI is an, uh, a platform of AI agents for data analysis. And we work with some of the fastest growing companies in the world. We work with Ramp, we work with Build, with Tinder or Hims, so a variety of industries. And basically, what I mean data analysis is that we help them from all the unstructured data that they have, uh, mine it into insights that are helpful in order to make decisions. And Lang AI started in 2018, right? Yeah, totally. You guys raised $15 million Series A? Yeah, exactly. So when we started in 2018, right, as you were saying, uh, AI wasn't cool yet. Um, I, I remember in some of the initial call calls, right, that I was doing where people are like, no, we don't want to use AI. Um, so uh, it's funny how everything has changed. But what we saw is the growth of digital platforms and all the data that was being generated. And we thought that businesses needed a way to uh, unlock all the value in this data, right? And we started with customer conversations um, or basically customer support tickets uh, because we saw that in consumer organizations, that was a huge uh, value and a huge wealth of data that wasn't being unlocked. Um, so when we started, we went deep into customer support and we partnered with Sendesk um, and we were providing basically AI on top of Sendesk to help with better routing of the tickets to agents, with better insights for the customer experience teams. And based on the growth and on our customers, we raised our Series A, as you were saying, in, in May of 2022, uh, we raised uh, 15 million to, to scale that, that product. So you've been building this product for four or five years uh, before Gen AI. So when, when Gen AI becomes mainstream, how did that impact your business? Yeah, good question. Um, and it's easier to look at it in hindsight, right? But uh, generative AI really changed the landscape. Um, I think first, it changed our industry, what we were selling, customer support. Um, second, it changed also um, how companies or organizations um, were looking to solve problems, right? Um, and third, I think it also evolved our team and how we had to go more into a mindset of experimentation. So, so starting with the first one, right, we were selling into, uh, into customer support and our whole predicament was that um, we were able to provide better insights to customer support or customer experience teams. And through that, they were gonna be able to impact change throughout the organization, right? And then Gen AI comes in and I think the first use case where people are thinking about uh, uh, applying AI with generative AI has been customer support. But they think about it from like a cost savings perspective, right? When you see even some of the articles out there, uh, you see companies like Klarna that they said that they're automating a lot of like support and they're saying they're, they're saving $40 million, right? It's all from like a cost uh, mindset uh, and not a revenue generation. So that changes how uh, we have to approach the market. And uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's also why now we're also focusing into, into product managers to process those insights, right? Um, so I would say that's like kind of like the biggest change of the three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember customer support uh, has always been like this like a second class citizen in a lot of fast growing organizations. Like, okay, it's a necessary cost there, but as I look at, potential investment opportunities, most of the capital goes towards your go-to-market or, or product function. So in your case now, you're mentioning how Gen AI made many companies more aware about the opportunity to not only save costs with customer support, but, but potentially make it more strategic. And I want to talk more about that. Like, how do you actually make customer support more strategic? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think a great example of this is uh, one of our customers, Ramp. Um, I think their VP of product was posting something in LinkedIn the other day where um, their uh, CX organization actually reports into product. And therefore, instead of solving every customer's pain point and offering a solution, 
they're trying to solve the underlying issues, right? So their goal is to maintain uh, the number of support tickets as low as possible, right? I think, uh, you know, what generative AI does is that uh, before, right, like you have the customer support team, maybe you see a platform like Zendesk and, you know, they're the ones controlling that, that data. For us, now the potential with generative AI is it's easier to open up the value of that data to other parts of the organization because it's easier to gather insights that are meaningful for product managers that are meaningful for salespeople without just having a customer support person having to have a conversation with someone else in the organization, right? So in a way, I see it as like it removes a lot of organizational bottlenecks. And I like what you said about RAMP, of putting customer experience as part of the product org. It's a really good way to, to show the, ne the need to, to connect that with what customers really want and how to solve for that, not just gather the problem and then ultimately not doing much about it. Um, but you also made something very interesting in your product. I noticed that your first iteration of the product was pretty much focused for, for customer experience teams. And then as you saw the opportunity in product teams now to access that information, you chose to create a separate product for the product team, right? But tell me more about that, why you went that route versus creating a single product for multiple personas. Yeah, totally. So I think, you know, related to what I was saying before, right? Like with the rise of, of generative AI, um, you know, I think our initial assumption of turning CX into a revenue driver was kind of like challenged. And we recognized that we should also invest efforts that could be more impactful if we invest resources into uh, creating products into areas that can be more uh, impactful towards revenue, right? And when you think about product management, right, and the potential of generative AI, I think a lot of product management work involves deciding what actions to take next. And we realized that generative AI could streamline a lot this process if it's able to provide instant and data-backed decisions for the product managers, right? And I think that's where the concept of AI agents for data analysis comes in. Um, can you have an agent that is providing you the data that you need um, tailored for the goal in your business that you're trying to solve as a product manager so that you can make the best decisions based on this data? Uh, can you clarify what is an AI agent? Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's a it's a concept that has been growing a lot recently, and there's a lot of companies that are developing AI agents. Um, uh, a definition of an AI agent is basically, um, an, it's almost like a human doing something with AI, right? And now it's the AI that's doing the work instead of the human, right? So can you have a process that operates autonomously and does a job or some work that a human was doing before, and then is able to present that work to the human that's kind of like managing that agent, or is able to do all that work autonomously, even without supervision of the human, right? So some examples of successful AI agents uh, that I have seen so far is, for example, an uh, AI uh, sales development um, representative, right? Where basically, you know, you have companies, um, one of them is, for instance, 11X, uh, where they've created this AI SDR that goes and starts targeting people and having conversations with people to book meetings for your company, right? In our case, when we're thinking about AI agents, we're thinking about it more as uh, they're able to provide you with the data analysis that you need because product managers spend a lot of time trying to find the right data. And if they had the data in front of them because an AI agent has done all that work, then we think they would be able to make better decisions and more instant decisions. Mm -hmm. So as you create these different AI agents to solve for specific use cases, how does that impact pricing on your product? Because I can imagine a lot of the B2B SaaS companies that are charging a certain fee per, per person per month, are they going to chair, change that to per agent per month or are there any other alternative pricing models? Yeah, that is a, that is a great question. It's something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, right? Um, and it's, I think, how generative AI has changed and shifted all the 
SaaS uh, arena in general, right? Because you know you have ChatGPT that costs twenty dollars a month, right, or more if you have like a team uh, license, and it provides so much value just for twenty dollars a month, right? So that's the expectations of people that are leveraging generative AI, at least from a data analysis perspective, right? And then you have all these companies that are trying to sign like long-term deals uh, that you know need approval for multiple people in the organization, right? Which is a completely different approach. Um, and from our perspective, we were one of the we were one of the latter, right? Like uh, companies that uh, you know have a long-term license with like. Um, um, you know, thousands or um, uh, even hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. And when we think about agents, um, the way we're thinking about it is like, how can we provide value to the user and so that the user can start using it tomorrow and then it can penetrate across the organization and then more people are leveraging the agent. So I think the agents are evolving a lot of the pricing in the enterprise. Although when you have something that can substitute a person, uh, like you know totally right like for instance that example of the ai sdr i think you're able to command a higher price because then you don't have to hire a person and instead you have an ai agent now i don't think this is possible with product managers at least not yet but i can imagine it we, we would get there at some point as long as the product that we are selling can justify that that roi that value right and i think traditional models we think about associating a seat to a human, but if there are going to be less humans, those uh, the, the pricing model can adapt, but they need to find a way to 10x that value. Otherwise, the company would say, well, I just buy less seats. Yeah, 100%. And this is exactly, I think, what happened in, in the industry where we started selling, right, in customer support. Uh, with like an organization like Sendesk, right, which was our main partner going into the customer support space, um, they sell a cost per license, right? And basically, they're a platform that prides themselves on like being the best platform for agents and for customer support people in general, right? Now, this whole generative AI comes in, and obviously, if uh, the future is that people are going to have less customer support um, people, right, or less customer support agents, like human agents, then they have to capture some of the value of the AI if at least they want to keep their revenue the same, right? So what happened is that they started building a lot of this AI internally and partnering less with solutions like us. And, and how do you think about this partnership that you have with Zendesk, for example, and other platforms like Intercom or, or Salesforce Service Cloud, is this a add-on to the platform that they are building or do you see yourself as a, an eventual platform that is replacing some of those products? Yeah, great question. And th that's um, where we've seen more of, that, more of our value transitioning out of customer support because um, before our uh, value proposition was we're going to provide certain insights to the customer experience team that's going to help them make better decisions throughout the organization, right? But now the customer experience team becomes more of like a call center because people are thinking about it from a generative AI perspective, how can I automate it, right? And so then those insights that we have are more valuable if we provide them directly to other areas of the organization, right? So what it means for us is we have less of a partnership with those organizations, to be honest, because they're trying to build the um, AI bots that um, automate uh, the majority of customer support. Yeah, for, for me as CEO, I'm thinking, <clears throat> I care less about the, the tool where that data lives as long as I have a layer that can gather those data points and transform them into insights so I can make a decision. Um, so obviously, I can see the value in bringing a lot of the data from customer success teams or customer support. But like, are there any other pockets in the organization where you see that you can tap into insights? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think this has been the, our realization as we've been doing customer discovery, because as I said, through this generative AI transformation, we enter into a new stage for our organization, right? Like where we have to figure out 
where to go and what products we build. And it's almost like we are in this phase of experimentation, right? So you're totally right. When you think about these AI agents, um, nobody's trying to say, oh, I just want these insights from this unstructured data. You're trying to solve a problem, right? If you are a product manager, maybe you're trying to optimize your conversion funnel. And to optimize your conversion funnel, yes, like if something is broken and your users start talking about it, you want to know because if not, you're going to lose revenue. But you also want to look at the data from events, at the data from other platforms. And the way we see these agents is that they're able to massage and combine all this data and tell you the things that you should be focusing on. Whereas it's product opportunities, right, that you should invest on, on a discovery phase or just like quick fixes that you should invest on because you're losing revenue uh, if we talk about that uh, conversion funnel. I want to move us on to the next phase with when the, making decisions with this. Okay, we, we got the insights and now it's time to, to do something about it. Classical situation, okay, who is saying this thing? Is this an average of customers? Are you putting extra weight on certain customers that are very void, very loud, but in reality, like how do you how you're able to slice and dice that data to really get to what a decision maker needs to know? Yeah, hundred percent. I think the key is that these agents uh, uh, need to be highly configurable for product teams and for product organizations because product people want to be in control, right? They are the ones that know the best what they're trying to optimize for. So uh, you're exactly right. Like we've had a lot of conversations with uh, product managers and a lot of times we hear, yes, customer conversations are helpful, but they drive like 10 to 20% of our roadmap, right? And there's all these other things that need to be taken into consideration to build a roadmap, right? So in the end, I think where AI is great is at aggregating all the data so that you don't have to go and talk to many people in the organization so that you don't have to go to and look at tools to find what you're looking for. And also uh, providing recommendations because it helps you expand your uh, creative ideas into things that you may not have thought of. Obviously, AI needs to have the same context that the product manager has. And that's that's where it's important to provide all this context uh, for these agents. And I think that's how AI agents for product uh, are going to work. You're going to have to I, provide I a lot of context. I, I think that's where the magic is, at least for product teams. I'm, I'm seeing different products in the space that are now adding these capabilities. And ultimately, the value is in being able to, to gather data points from different tools that are already in place, but also when providing those recommendations, being very crisp about how that segmentation has been made or even allow flexibility for the person who's interpreting the data to create their own segmentation to ultimately get to a certain level of insights that is unique and not just an average of what's going on. 100%. I, I have a phrase that I noted actually from, a, from an interview that I really like based on what you said, which is, if you can execute on the promise and the recommended actions are the right recommended actions that drive business value, then it's mission critical software, right? So you need that, that ability to prove um, that you can trace that involvement and where the data is coming from and connecting that to up to the bottom line, right? I think that's, that's the key of kind of like what you're saying there. Yeah, totally. I, I just think that it's very typical, and especially as the organization gets larger, to try to optimize, try to optimize for everybody or for the lowest common denominator, instead of being having a stronger point of view on something that is going to please some people and probably piss off others. But there is like a conscious decision behind that because you ultimately want to delight some and not just try to be a wishy-washy solution that ultimately doesn't really add value and gives you to an average, gets you to an average result. Hundred percent, and we see that a lot with um, the friction between product organizations and customer support or CX organizations, right? Where, um, you know, related to what you were saying before, CX comes and says like, hey, these are our top 10 pain points. And product is like, okay, great. But like, what does that mean, right? Like those are not changing every month. Like, are they aligned to our priorities, right? So I think that's like the key of like product having that control. So let's talk about your own go-to-market and how you 
are able to show some of that value to some of the product teams that are really skeptical. They probably think, oh my God, we have too many tools. So how do you go about delighting them and give, getting, getting yourself an opportunity to show how your solution can add more value? Yeah, totally. That's a great question. And um, I think, as I was saying before, what we have realized is that in this transformation that's happening, that as we've said, we believe it can really impact product management. Uh, we ourselves as an organization have gone into a more experimental phase, right? Where we're asking ourselves these questions. What is the fastest path to add value to a product manager? And when you think about that, you think about the different pain points that product managers have and how can you provide value, right? So I can give you a few examples. The first one, we've built an experience where, um, you know, for the organizations that we are targeting, we have scraped reviews that they have online. And we have uh, basically, if you are an e-commerce company, we think that you would care about your conversion funnel and that you would care about the quality of your products. So we have created an online report with uh, usability to get into like, what are the top pain points regarding quality of your product? And you can click it, that link openly in the website. So then we're adding value even we have, without having a conversation to that product team, right? And following that experience, we're doing the same thing with different AI agents, right? So like product organizations are constantly launching new features. How can you have an agent that is telling you how the new how the new feature is going as fast as possible, right? Uh, and you know, repeat that story with like as many experiments that we can run in parallel. Uh, this story reminds me of Clearbit, <clears throat> and they they offer this option to companies to upload a spreadsheet, and they would return that spreadsheet with rich information about all the different contacts and like their industry, their location, their email, and other other requests that they had. I think that is really powerful because in the age of product-led growth, you know, a lot of companies offer either a free trial or a standard demo. Being able to not just agree, give a free trial, but like hold the hand of that person throughout the free trial and ensure that you're building something relatively custom for them ultimately takes more time, but shows, proves more value. And I think, especially when you're trying to sell to educated customers, like a product manager, who's already skeptical, it's been, uh, you, you, you only have one shot and, and it has to be a delighter. I don't think, you know, like just trying to provide a simple free trial is always the, the right way to go. No, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, you have to add into that too, the amount of noise in the space, right? Like the amount of companies that are building generative AI products uh, to help product managers and to help other parts of the organization, right? And, um, you know, there's there's clear demand. I was actually running uh, these um, SEO search using SEMrush. And, you know, there's, there's uh, about 600 people a month searching in the US for AI for product managers. To put that in context for sales is only 720, right? So just a little bit more and marketing is 1000. So uh, AI for product managers is something that people are looking for almost in the same rate as sales and marketing, right? So there is demand for it, but there's also a lot of noise. So it's how did you stand out uh, in, in the middle of all that noise? <laughs> well, in part, that's why I wanted you to be here, right? To, to shed some light and explain specific use cases like, like this one. Because everybody has heard, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's changing everything. Yeah, but how? And in my product team, like, what are, how can I actually be part of the solution and not just wait to be disrupted? Um, so what's next? So we are now in this phase where these agents are being smarter. They are being able to give us insights and giving them faster. What do you think is going to be the next wave of innovation for for product teams? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, the way I think about product teams is that it's very um, creative people, also very hacky people, right, that can connect the pieces in different platforms. And I think that today it's very difficult for product managers to make decisions. And it's something that we have found when talking to people, right? And there's also this kind of like risk when you're making a decision because 
if you don't have enough data to back it up, or even if you have enough data to back it up, if you make a mistake, it may be expensive, right? So this is where I think AI can be super powerful. And I think this is already happening in other teams like growth teams where, um, you know, the product person uh, can become an orchestrator of all these different AI agents that work to their advantage. And I think product people need to be able to leverage AI to tweak it, to change the prompts, uh, to include the context that they have, because in the end, that's how they're going to be able to deliver way more value and way faster because you have AI working for you. I think that transformation is going to happen in product management. And my perspective is that, is that it could be faster than we think. And how technical do you think the product people need to be in order to make the most out of these uh, AI agents and, and opportunities? So that's a great question, right? And I think, you know, if we go back to what we were talking at the beginning um, of like why we started Lang, part of it was, you know, we want AI to be helpful for business people without them having to be technical, right? And I think generative AI has really changed that, right? Like um, being able to create prompts uh, for ChatGPT or Anthropic or whatever it is um, has become super easy. And I think any product manager should be able to do it, right? And when you're thinking about managing AI agents, in the end, it's like, managing any other type of technology that they're probably used to, right? Like Mixpanel or Amplitude or whatever it is, just like with a different interface. So I don't think product managers need to be more technical than they are today. I think the tools and the way they use the tools is just going to evolve quickly. Well, Jorge, it's been a pleasure to learn from your own experience building AI from the trenches. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Carlos. This has been, this has been great. Thank you for having me.